welcome to 30 Minute Reviews. I am Adam. I'm tired today, and I still have a lot to do, too. It is 5.30 um, on, what's it called, on uh, Wednesday, as some call it. I'm going to see Bell tonight, which is an anime movie from the guy who directed, um, I don't remember the name of it. it came out recently, though. Um, but, and I have heartburn for some reason. Probably something to do with the fact that all I had today to eat, or ingest in general, was a large soda. Um, anyway, enough about me. Um, we're not going to talk about the Giants getting rid of their, you know, their GM and coach, thankfully, um, because this is not a sports podcast, and when I've tried to inject sports into podcasts in the back, there has been revolts. Uh, by the listening audience out there. Um, By the way, if you want to submit topics for discussion on the show, you can submit to 30minutereviews at gmail.com. I will be selecting topics from there. Today, we have news. And that will be our primary topic of conversation. Because this captured my imagination a little bit. Um... Today, it was revealed that earlier this week there was a patent filed, or last week, because today's the 12th, um, and then next, uh, what's it called, next, uh, last week would have been the 6th, it would have been about a week ago, uh, there was a patent filed by um, someone at PlayStation for backward compatibility um, through a bunch of technical jargon. Um, now, the PlayStation 5 is already backward compatible with the you know, previous generation console, uh, the PlayStation 4, as some call it, um, and, and if you, if we look at, like, you know, what, why do I feel like I have to sneeze all of a sudden, but it's night, so I can't look up at the sky and sneeze, which is very annoying, um, which is, like, this new back compatibility, and, and I, and there's an argument to be made for why back compatibility should be a thing, and it's, you know, about, historical preservation, and I know that, you know, people out there are going to hear historical preservation and and video game in the same sentence and be like, oh, well, that's, you know, shitty, like, that's not historical, that's not important, but preservation of video games is just as important as preservation of film or preservation of music, it's just another art form, Um, it's an interactive art form rather than, you know, where you're actively engaged rather than passively engaged, like with music or movies, and I mean, even to say passively engaged for those, because, you know, if you're watching a movie, you still should be actively engaged. But to say that you shouldn't preser- uh, preserve a video game it is, you know, not conducive. Because it's like, you know, number one, there are a few reasons why back compatibility is not something that, um, you know, developers tend to want. Number one, if, if it's backward compatible and you're not adding and, and you can play the game ad infinitum, ad infinitum, if I'm pronouncing that right, as I attempt to sound smarter than I am, um, if that is the, you know, if, if you can do that and I can, you know, dust off my, my CD copy of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone for the PlayStation 1 and I can put it into my... Uh, my PlayStation 5 when I inevitably get one. If I, you know, if I put it in there, I can play the game exactly as it was back then. You know, there's no incentive for, you know, like, there's no reason for them to remake it. And if they do remake it, there's no reason for me to go out and buy the remake. That's a bad example because, you know, they're never going to remake Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone for the PlayStation. Uh, it's just the first game that, you know, I pulled out of the ether into, you know, where we're going to be. We're lucky it wasn't Land Before Time or, um, fucking dinosaur, which, you know, that game, like, I got Hercules from my computer because the PlayStation 1 Hercules game was, I guess, multi-platform at some point, either way, it was available to buy on GOG, so I bought it for computer, and I, I play, uh, I played it, and it's like, wow, this game has aged just as poorly as it did when it was originally played, because I hated it then, and it's still not fun now, anyway, um, you know, like, let's say that there's a, 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 um, a, if there's a way for the Sega Genesis version... Actually, we can use Disney as an example, because Disney did put out three of their games as, as you know, as, as... Not remakes, even, as we've ported them exactly as they were. 
Um, and Nintendo's great about this. We'll talk about that in a little bit, though. But so, so Disney puts out uh, a collection of Aladdin, The Lion King, and most recently, if you buy the collection, it also comes with The Jungle Book. Um, Aladdin and Lion King are considered some of, you know, the best licensed games, especially for Sega Genesis. So, you know, that release comes out. I bought it. I played it. It's just as fun as it was back then, and it's the exact same game as it was back then. Um, but here's the thing. If that's happening, and I can, if it's possible for me to, with ease, go back and play my Sega Genesis, and play these games as they were, I have no reason to buy this this thing, which thus doesn't get them the $20 I paid for. I think I paid less than I bought it on Black Friday, but still, it's like, it's it still, you know, it, it, it doesn't give them that incentive to, it, you know, to, to do that. Now, also, let's look at, you know, the other big one, which is Mario, um, what's it called? Um, Mario, uh, um, Super Mario Sunshine, Super Mario 64, Super Mario Galaxy, um, which came out as a, a collected anniversary edition um, of last year, two years ago. You know, I, I was talking about this the other day with someone, and it's like, ever since the pandemic, it's everything's kind of blurred together, and I don't know when anything happened in regard to other things. It's like, before times, and then, you know, it's like pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, but if it happened during the pandemic, I can't be more specific about when it happened in regard to anything else. Um, so, like, you know... Which is incredibly annoying if you have release dates to keep in mind because you have shit coming out because it's all just kind of blurring together in one giant dystopian nightmare. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, the, the, this game came out and it wasn't like they remastered it in any way or changed anything. Like, yeah, they remapped the controls because they had to because the GameCube controller had haptic feedback, but the Switch controller does not. Um, and for Super Mario Sunshine, haptic feedback was a big part of it, where if you press down, but not click it all the way down, the trigger, what would happen is you would be able to move around and spray with flood. If you push it down all the way, so it locks in, it clicks all the way down to the bottom, it would lock you in place and you'd be able to, you know, like, kind of like become a turret and position your, and, and just stay stationary and, and change the direction of your, of your flow. Um, and that, you know, that wasn't, wouldn't be possible on the Switch, because pressing down the trigger is a button, it's not a, you know, a, a thing where it has different effects based on holding it down, um, completely down versus, you know, holding it, like, halfway down just to spray water, um, and the other thing was, if I remember correctly from my GameCube, um, the, the Switch, uh, the, the, like, the harder you push down on it, uh, the more, how powerful it was so like you'd be able to like you know go go forward like go further out or, or closer with your mm -hmm. with your thing um so yeah um they needed to do some changes there but besides that the game is basically identical. They didn't upscale it. Like, when you play Super Mario 64, like, granted, it is a Super Mario 64 port, not a Super Mario 64 DS port, um, but the graphics were the N64 graphics, not the graphics for the... not even what they were upscaled to when they remade it in 2006, 2007 for, for the DS, which is like, well, you, you, you could have used, at least done that level of graphics and upscaled it to that. Like, look, I... I, I like. I get the point here, and it's like you're trying to sell me the nostalgia of playing this game, but if I, you know, if, if I'm someone who has never played this game before, which, I mean, I have, but if I'm someone who hasn't played this game before and I'm coming into it dry, um, then I think that it, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, I'd rather have the graphics be upscaled, especially if you're going to package it to me for, uh, for, for $60 in full retail. Well, I mean, technically it's three games in one, but it's still, you're still packaging it in at full retail for the three games, and they're three games that are not brand new, they're three games that are, you know, you're not adding anything to them, you're not even upscaling the graphics, like, you know, it, it, it's kind of ridiculous, and it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we look at like, um, like that game wouldn't have a reason to exist in a world where backward compatibility is prevalent. Now, of course, Nintendo has 
systemic issues that prevent back compatibility in the same way the PlayStation Portable has systemic issues that keep back compatibility from happening there. Like, because the, the PSP uses UMD, which, you know, never caught on with anything besides them, and, and also used the, the Memory Stick Pro Duo, which, again, again, the pr proprietary software um, is one of the things that's the bane of the existence to the consumer because it's like, well, I gotta buy this from them, and then I gotta pay their price for it, and, and now it's like, you know, everything is proprietary. Like, you can't buy a third-party party PlayStation controller. Like, you can't buy a third-party Xbox controller. You have to buy the one that they make. Otherwise, you're SOL, and then you just gotta, you know, you just gotta do without. Um, and it's like, I remember even back in the day, you'd be able to buy third-party third party controllers. Where it's like, you know, yeah, like, in um, the... the well, They made the... the um, the guitars for Guitar Hero, but you didn't have to buy the version that Harm uh, not Harmonix. I forgot what company put out Guitar Hero. Harmonix put out um, Rock Band, but you don't have to, you didn't have to buy Harmonix Rock Band equipment. There were other countries, uh, countries, companies that put out, you know, guitars and drum sets and all of that, so you could play, you know, you could you could use their stuff instead of the ones that were specifically made by the company that did it, and that would drive prices down. Because then, here's the thing, if I can go to, you know, Walmart and buy the Walmart brand controller, why would I buy the Xbox brand controller besides status? And, but in the same way that, like, yeah, there's, you know, you can buy designer clothes or you can buy Walmart clothes, it, it, it does, in a way, drive down the price having that. So when the company goes out and makes it where no one else can do that, it, it, it does put a little bit of a dampener on, what's it called, uh, on the ability to, you know, the ability to, to I mean, it, it makes it very profitable for the parent company, but that's about it. Um, it for the consumer, it's not, it's not good. Um, so in a world where this is now prevalent and, and all of that, the, the fact that back compatibility is not widespread makes a ton of sense. Um, and because backward compatibility is entirely about making it where the consumer can use their stuff beyond the life of the console. Um, so when Sony trademarked this, my thought is not, oh, Sony's trademarking back compatibility in an effort to um, make it that way they can make it a selling point for their console. I, I'm more likely, to, I'm more inclined to believe that they're trademarking it or copywriting or patenting the ability to do it, whatever the right word is, they're doing that so that way they can have a hold on it where you can't do it. Like, Sony has the right the rights to, you know, using this particular method of doing it, but they can now charge you for it. Um, and I think that, like, you know, there, there's, there, there are problems to be had um, with this coming this way. And I think that, you know... Nintendo doing the Switch Online Pass um, was kind of a thing being like, oh, wait a minute, we can do that too. But the Switch, you have to do their stuff because Nintendo changed... And that was a thing too, is Nintendo changed the the type of disc with each, the, the type of uh, vehicle to receive your, your game with each generation, like the cartridge change sizes... So that way, like, if I had a um, an NES, I couldn't go back and play an SNES game on it. I need to get the new console to play the new games. Um, if I had, um, like, an N64, you couldn't play your N64 games on the, what's it called? On the, um, what's it called? On the, uh, on, on the, on the, the GameCube, that's the word I'm looking for. Um couldn't play them on the GameCube because the GameCube didn't have a slot for it. The GameCube went to the little disc. Then, you know, once you went GameCube to Wii, to the Wii, like, to their, like, you know, to their credit, they were good about that, Nintendo, um, where you could play GameCube games on, and, and, and the Game Boys were all back compatible with each other, um, up until the DS, and then once, you know, they end of life to the DS Lite, you, you couldn't play Game Boy Advance games on them anymore. Here's the thing, though. I think that, you know, it's never going to happen because the money that goes into copyright law is, you know, by and large going to be one of those things where it's it's too expensive to, um, to do that. 
where it's like like lob, like the lobbying money that goes into um, copywriting and, and all of that, which is why the copyrights almost never expire now. Besides things that were that were made before, you know, the laws changed. But it, it's virtually impossible now to get a copyright expired and, and to get unless there's you know someone just willingly gives up the copyright. Um, what what should happen? is, you know, companies should not be allowed to make claims on games that are not in active circulation. And what I mean by that is, like, let's say I have, I'm going to use Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone again. I have Harry Potter and Sorcerer's Stone for PlayStation 1. Um, like, if I play that game... Or if I make a console, like if I, I build a PlayStation, like, like, you know how Retron has that console that allows you to play, like, NES, SNES, Sega Genesis, and Game Boy games? Like, that console, like, your hardware patent should run out after a certain point where, you know, if I'm using, like, you know, if I, if I make a, you know, a software, like, if I run an emulator... Um, on there that can that can simulate the PlayStation One, and I make one of those that's like, hey, I will do this, and it's like we're not making PlayStation Ones anymore. As Sony, it's like, how can I make a valid claim? Because I'm not taking away money from them. I'm not taking money out of Sony's pocket by making a PlayStation One, you know, hardware that can play PlayStation One games natively now, because that's something that Sony, you know, can't do, like, or, or refuses to do, it's, like, in the same way that it's, it is sitting on a trademark by, or, like, it's illegal to squat on something, um, and, and patents go into the public domain all the time, that's why all of a sudden now Roman exists, and Blue Chew, and, and all of these other companies that, that are now making, essentially, Viagra for, you know, for dirt cheap and by mail order, um, Pfizer, who, who created, um, uh, what's it called, who created Viagra back in whenever that was made, um, no longer has the, the patent on the drug, so it's now anyone can use it. Um, once the patent runs out, anyone can use it. So the idea that this pat these patents, you know, are existing in perpetuity as intellectual property, that they can now just sit on and be like, hey, this is something that, you know, is ours, like, look, I think that they, like, if a console were to come out, and a console were to have the ability to play all games, um, and you were able to, you know, update the console, like, if they're, like, I think that there's a market for a modular console that has a laser that can read, um, uh, multiple types of discs, and, and all of that, and I think that there's a, a, a genuine market for it. And if that were the case, then why does this not exist yet? Um, and and I'm just asking this as someone who has no technical know-how to be able to build one himself. I'm, I'm just saying, like, if it exi- if there's a possibility of this existing, I would like to see someone do this, someone with money who could litigate against the, the companies who are going to inevitably sit and be like, hey, you can't do that. But if you're not going to do it, I'm not taking money out of your pocket. I think that's why, uh, Ray, uh, not Raycon, um, um, the Retron can exist. The Retron 5, um, which for those of you who don't know, is a console you can buy that has ports in it for your uh, NES Famicom, SNES Super Famicom, um, Sega Genesis uh, Mega Drive, um, and then Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and, and, um, and, and straight Game Boy games. And you can play all of them on this one console. And I think the reason for that is, is that you, you, they can't make you give that, like, that's not something that is, um, what's it called? Uh, that, that is trademarkable anymore. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, as these things come, like, Someone out there has to be working on a modular console where you'll be able to just swap out, you know, parts as, as parts become, you know, free of the patent and are easier to make and, and all of that. Um, I know for a fact that the uh, the laser for the GameCube is hard to come by. 
um, because my GameCube is 15 years old, 16, 17 years old, uh, and the laser is shot. The laser on the laser reader is just shot, um, as tends to happen with consoles that reach a certain age. Um, and the reason for that is, is that, you know, use and, and all of that. And, and I asked the guy at my local game store, I'm like, hey, can, um, can this be replaced? Can I go and, is there a way to buy a GameCube laser and I'll just replace it myself? It, it can't be too hard. And he said, no, no, no. The GameCube laser is so specific to the GameCube. The only way you can get a laser for a GameCube is by having a GameCube um, that has a working laser and then taking the laser from that, putting it into your GameCube. And I said, well, at that point, I might as well just buy a new GameCube. He's like, exactly. Um, so therein lies, you know, another, you know, problem with, you know, with this. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think we live in a world where, um, there will eventually be an updated Retron, um, that can do this, but I think a modular console is also something that could work, whereas, like, you have the base, and then you have the, you know, like, other parts that can be added on, and it's like, you buy the NES add-on, you buy, and the thing is, too, it's like, I'd be smart, I wouldn't use the, the trade names, because that, that would be stupid, I'd be like, the whatever add-on, based on the year that they came out, like, the 96 add-on would be, like, everything you need to run, um, what's it called, games, um, N64 games on it, and it's like, oh, well, that's, you know, something, and the thing is, too, it's like, you know, I think that if Nintendo were to sell the games as Switch games, that would eliminate this problem, like, if they're, if the games are available to, to for sale through the, through the, the person who made it, they can make a copyright claim, and say, like, hey, we are buying this, you know, we are still selling this, you are, we're losing money by this sale, by this third party, um, and, I, see, I think that that's the problem with copyright law, to an extent, is that, like, you know, yeah, someone shouldn't be able to just take artwork from someone else, and, and, and or, or games from someone else and sell it as their own, I shouldn't be able to go on, buy, like, get a game, copy it to a disc, make mass copies of the disc, and then sell them for $5 a pop, or however much you sell the game for, I shouldn't be allowed to do that. That said, um, if the company decides they're not going to make the game anymore, and the game's not for sale anywhere, if I want to release the game for free, I should be allowed to. Um, or, like, basically free, because, like, you can go to a store and buy one of those things that has, like, 100 games on it for, like, 10 bucks, and it looks like a Game Boy. Um, but yeah, I, um, I feel like there's a market for this. Uh, I'm going to get into an exploratory, uh, idea about how to design this and, and, and make it a reality, I feel like. Maybe that'll be my big impact on the world, is the, the modular video game console that you get more, that you can, you know, add on parts to with, you know, relative ease. Um, I feel like there, there's no reason why the laser has to be... Um, designed to be hard to to change. Um, besides the fact they don't want you to change the laser at, but if it's designed where you can change the laser at with ease, and if it's designed where it's like, hey, we can, you know, if you want to do it, you can. If you can figure out how to make it so that way they can play these games, you are free to. It's not the design, you know, thing. And if I say like, hey, you avoid the warranty by doing this, then. You know, it's, you know, we aren't endorsing you doing it. Um, I mean, it could become something that could, you know, potentially crash the entire, you know, market. Um, as long as we're not the ones selling the, you know, the ones that can handle games of that caliber. Like, if it's just enough that you can handle, like, you know, old, old games that aren't in circulation anymore, and then people are like, oh, well, if I do X, Y, and Z, or some other company sees it, it's like, hey, we'll do, you know will make add-ons for this that can do X, Y, and Z. Um, that could lead to, to great innovation in, in the thing. But the thing is, I think to an extent, the industry doesn't really want to innovate to the degree that the player wants to innovate. Like, a player wants innovation in a way that the industry doesn't. The industry wants innovation that's cheap and that is mass marketable and is profitable, not innovation that will, you know 
take research and development time or take the opportunity, take the time to, you know, build out and, and, and change everything in a, in a deep and meaningful way. Um, so, this seemed a little rambly, um, which is good that I got it on my system now because I'm seeing Bell later and I prefer not to be rambly reviewing Bell. I know nothing about Bell going into it. Um, but that review will be on Beware of Spoilers. Um, the, you know, this will be on 30 Minute Reviews as to be expected. Uh, didn't really talk about, you know, John Watts going on to Final Destination. It's one of those things that, like, originally I was like, you know, this is probably a bad idea. Um, because it's like, he doesn't really do horror. Like, he does, you know, high school stuff well. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. High, uh, Final Destination has always been high school students. Um who avoid death and then end up, you know, dying one by one. So maybe it is a good fit. Um, because the thing is, it's like, there's no way he can be by himself on this. So, you know, maybe it'll be good. Uh, that said, if I were to do uh, Final Destination, I'd pick one of the Spider-Man directors, it would be Sam Raimi, but I don't know if Sam Raimi would be the one who would go in and do Final Destination 6. Um, who else was that? What else was there? I feel there was another big news. Oh, the SAG nominations came out. Not really going to address that too much. Like, you know, it feels weird that Jared Leto got a nomination for House of Gucci. Um, considering he's basically playing Mario. Um, his Italian accent is, like, borderline offensive. Like, I'm sorry. Like, it's not, like... Like, Lady Gaga does, like, a real Italian accent. Like, what someone who actually... Like, and the same with, like, Adam Driver. He does, uh, like, a normal Italian accent. Like, like it, 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 the Italian accent that Jared Leto does sound like the Italian accent that an Irish person does when they're sitting at an Irish pub making fun of Italian people. Um, and, and I feel like that, like, that shouldn't be getting a nomination um, for, for that. It's just stupid, too. It takes you out of the movie. Um, what else was there? Um, I don't know. I think that's it. Um, so we'll be back later today with uh, other cool things that may be happening uh, later this week. I don't know what's going on. Um, if news happens, we will report on it. And if not, we will not. Um, but yeah, we will wrap up there for today. So until then, have a great rest of your week.